Pura vida. Good afternoon and good morning. Uh, welcome to another edition of Inside Talk. My name is Kelly Coughlin. Thank you very much for joining us today. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, Inside Talk is our monthly event series that is designed to educate, inform, and inspire future travel. Um, here we connect with our wonderful partners, our tour architects, and our talk directors to give you just a little bit of a taste of what you can experience with us on tour. Uh, today, we are joined by Talc Director Ivan Hoyas, who is uh, coming to us from Panama live, uh, where the iconic Panama Canal sits just moments from his doorstep. So there's no better person to talk to us today about the Panama Canal and Costa Rica cruise. Um, Ivan has worked with Talc for, uh, in that region with Talc for over 20 years as a Talc Director and a naturalist. He also directs many of our East Africa tours, including our Bridges Family Adventures there. He has just returned from our small ship cruise around the Scottish Isles. He's a really busy guy and we're lucky to have him. But before we get started today, let me just give you a couple housekeeping items. Everybody is on mute. If you have questions, please type them into the chat function as you see at the bottom of your screen. And if you have questions, just pop them in there as they come to your mind. We'll try and get to as many of them as possible. Many of you have questions about your upcoming tour. Uh, we won't be able to answer those specific questions today. So do go ahead and call our reservation sales counselors to get those specifics answered. This will last around 45 minutes. It will be recorded. So if you would like to check it out at a later date or invite somebody to check it out later, you can do that at talk.com slash blog. Now back to today's topic. Um, a guest favorite tour returning for 2023, the Panama and Costa Rica, uh, the Panama Canal and Costa Rica cruise. We have very limited availability for 2023. So if you're thinking you might want to join us, reach out to our reservation sales counselors soon. Today, Ivan will be discussing what it's like to travel through Panama Canal, give us a little touch of history. Um, he'll explain the unique experiences on Panama's islands and give you some of the choice activities in Costa Rica. So Ivan, come on in, let's get started. There you are. Hi. Hi, good morning. Right. Yeah, you good, good, good. So before you kind of get into things, can you just start us out by telling us a bit about the small ship cruising experience with Tauk? Absolutely. I tell you, these uh, explorer-sized vessels, I think, I think we're up to something good here. Um, I, as you mentioned, I just came from Scotland, and I have to say I, I love the size. It just seems like we have the perfect mixture here of something not too big and, and not too small. Uh, when I was on board, I felt like there was enough public spaces for everyone to kind of find your little nook and cranny within within the vessel, there was a uh, you know just spaces like uh, the lounges, the outdoor areas, the uh, the theater. I just felt like uh, we found that he, our guests could find their little space. And as you walked around, you could see oh you know you could say hello to everyone and see how how comfortable everybody felt. I thought inside the vessel that was fantastic. I like the idea of 
having uh, different choices for, for folks on board. We have uh, you know different restaurants on board. They had this small breakfast station. So if you were an early riser, you can grab your, 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 cup, your cup of coffee or your cup of tea and find your special place, um, whether it was reading a book or enjoying the surroundings. I thought that was fantastic. You know what else I also enjoyed was when we went on our excursions, the, the, the locals, uh, the staff, uh, those in the port looked, looked at the ship and, and their, their response was more like, wow, it, it, you're in a yacht. You know, they didn't say, oh, you're in a cruise ship. You know, they said, oh, you're in a yacht. You know, so it was it was really nice that we were perceived this way that way. So it wasn't just about how we felt on board, but also how they they perceived us. And I tell you the other thing, I we will have on on these Explorer class ships, we might have 150 guests, 160, maybe 170. Uh, but I tell you what, the crew's 110. I found that to be incredible. What a ratio! 110 crew. For the number of tout guests, I thought that really uh, that's that's phenomenal, and I, you don't get that today on these much larger, much larger ships. Oh, I can think of one more thing: the 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 draft of these vessels. It's only fifteen feet. It's only a fifteen feet draft, which allows you to access a lot of places that larger ships just simply cannot. So, those are just a few things that can come to mind about small ship cruising with with tout. That is true. The small ship cruising definitely has some big advantages. Um, but, you know, a lot of the people here today want to hear a bit about this epic Panama Canal experience. <laughs> so can you walk us through what that's like with Tauk on these smaller vessels? Absolutely. And I tell you what, that is yet another reason why small ship cruising is phenomenal for, for this departure. And that is exactly the Panama Canal. To be able to talk to someone when you're on the ship, because you know, we, we have a narrator that comes on board. Uh, you of course have us, the tour directors, uh, you've got local staff, but we have a narrator that comes on board the Tauk ship and does all the commentary and the narration on the Panama Canal. But at the same time, you can see the person. He or she is not some voice coming from the speakers throughout the, the vessel. It's actually someone you can approach and you can talk to and so that's a, an extra plus about going through the canal on a small ship. I can definitely walk you through the transit of the Panama Canal. But before we do that, I have to say that I have to give you just a little bit of history. Just, just a wee bit, as they say, a wee bit of history. And I will definitely jump into the day, to the point-by-point -point transiting of the Panama Canal. But we have to understand a little bit of the background of why the canal is where it is. And the idea of having goods or people moving from one ocean to the other. Kelly, that predates the Panama Canal itself. It goes back to the 1500s when you had Spanish conquistadors, household names like Francisco Pizarro and Balboa crossing the Isthmus of Panama, where you see that red line, that is the Darien, the Darien region of Panama. They went across that way, but later on they relocated to you that little black square box, which is where today, the Panama Canal is located. And as the Spanish arrived, all the conquistadors arrived, all of that gold and silver from South America starts making its way up to North America. And then you actually have, I'm sorry, to Europe. And then you also have a lot of goods coming from Europe. So it creates what's called the Golden Triangle. This is actually the commercial route used by the Spaniards. And this is setting the pace, setting the stage for a Panama Canal that would allow goods and services to come across like it does today. You know, this actually led to the Spaniards establishing cities on both ends, including what is now called Panama Viejo, which is an, a city that lays in ruins right now, Kelly. Yeah, that city there, it lays in ruins because just like Pizarro and Balboa are household names for us. So are Drake and Henry Morgan, buccaneers, privateers that came to the region and they actually sacked, Morgan sacked this city. This is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, by the way. And little commercial break, we do visit this on our days when we are here in Panama City. So what happens is, 
you know, we can fast forward a few years in the very same narrow part of the isthmus. Isthmus is a word you're going to hear a lot when you're here. A narrow body of water connect or, or land connecting two larger bodies of land. The Isthmus of Panama became the stage, even years later, for U.S. citizens, for that matter, or those moving west to California. And you can see on the next image that we'll show you the route that the so-called 49ers used. Sutter's Mill, there's gold in the hills, and people start moving from the east coast of the U.S. to the west coast of the United States. And back then, believe it or not, one of the quickest and safest routes was to take a vessel down to Panama, go across the isthmus using the Spanish trail, and then over to California. In fact, that prompted private venture to build a train to cross the isthmus of Panama. And that train actually predates the transcontinental railroad in the United States by about 14 years. And that train moved people across. And back then, before the canal was built, there was already a link between the Isthmus of Panama and the United States. And I'll show you two names that you all know if you're from the U.S., and that's Lieutenant Ulysses Grant back then. Before he became president, he was stationed in the west coast of the U.S., so he moved through Panama, left Governor's Island in New York, and waded all the way to the west coast of the United States using Panama, using the train. And this guy here, Levi Strauss, Levi Strauss, an immigrant from Bavaria that made its way to the east coast of the U.S., actually came down to Panama, went across the isthmus, looking for that gold that was just found, new opportunities in the textile industry. I don't need to tell you what Levi Strauss is known for, California, and he made it through Panama. So it's incredible how many people went through. And this actually sets the stage furthermore for a canal. You know, the French tried building a canal here in the 1880s. They were not successful in building a canal, but they were extremely successful in leaving their print on our architecture. This is Casco Viejo neighborhood of Panama City. Another commercial break. We actually visit this UNESCO World Heritage Site on our talk tour while here in Panama. So it's incredible that the French tried. They were not successful, but they left their architectural footprint in the colonial neighborhood of Panama. As we can see in the next image, in fact, the French embassy is still located in, in this neighborhood. Okay, so I, I, I had to tell you a little bit about the history. I just, it's just to set everything up. Let's, let's do a transit of the Panama Canal. Let's do it. So how does, how does this start? Well, um, if we start, say, on the Atlantic side or Caribbean side, you might have you might have a little locomotive, as you can see here. These electric locomotives, they're called mules. They were built by General Electric and built exclusively for the Panama Canal. And you see a little rowboat there. So what's happening here is that rowboat will take the line from the vessel and tie it to the locomotives because we are, we are assisted as we go through the Panama Canal by these locomotives. So we're entering the chambers. We are tied to the locomotives. They help keep the vessel center channel. And then we enter the first set of locks. So we have Gatun locks on the Atlantic side. Now, what happens here? The vessel, there are three steps or three lock systems within Gatun locks. A vessel enters the locks and you see, you see the gates there. Those gates will close behind the ship and in front of the ship and it creates a pocket. And what's happening now is water from the locks further up is actually going to fill the locks where we are located. And this happens below the vessel. We don't really see it. We see water turning as this is happening. And this is a series of culverts which can move 25 million gallons of water in approximately eight minutes with zero pumps involved. It's all about gravity. It's all gravity based. It's incredible. And so the ship will do this for three steps, one mile long, Gatun locks. And then all of a sudden we've gone from sea level to 85 feet above sea level. And we enter what's called Gatun Lake. Gatun Lake is a massive 
body of water, which was created by the United States, by the Corps of Engineers between 1904 and 1914. When does Gatun Lake? 1910, 1911, 1912. An incredible engineering feat. And thanks to folks like John Stevens, if you've been up in Washington State and you've gone through Stevens Pass, same John Stevens, folks like John Stevens who came and designed this Panama Canal and said, Panama has a lot of rain, so let's take advantage of the rain and let's make ourselves an artificial lake, which is what we use to feed the chambers of the locks. By the way, the Panama Canal is 100% fresh water, all fresh water, which is incredible. But this lake isn't just a series of concrete and steel and metal. It's actually a rainforest. This lake is a rainforest where amidst all of these blooming trees amidst all of this biodiversity, you have ships crossing each other, ships going north to the Atlantic and then south to the Pacific. You heard it right, north to the Atlantic, south to the Pacific, because Panama runs east-west. It can get a little confusing, but when you're here, we'll explain it furthermore. So what happens? The ship continues through the lake, this gorgeous lake full of rainforest, and then the ship enters what's called the cut. If I have to say, the locks are probably the sort of romantic side of the canal. It's what most of us envision, what most of us perceive the whole canal to be. They, the locks are just part of the Panama Canal. The cut is probably the blood, sweat, and tears. The cut is where everything happened. This is where a lot of workers thousands of workers would use dynamite. I mentioned General Electric earlier. I think all of us know General Electric today. I'll mention another company, DuPont, who supplied all the dynamite used to. Can you appreciate in the screen, if you see to the left and right of that ship, that's, that's the Ancon, it's the first ship that went through the canal. That used to be a landmass. That All of that was a landmass. They moved enough dirt, enough rock, enough material in the Panama Canal to build a Great Wall of China from New York to San Francisco. If you take the actual Great Wall of China, it goes from St. Louis to New York. To give you an idea of how much stuff was moved, 375, 380 million cubic yards of material were moved. And all this with a synchronized system of locomotives and dredges all working at the same time to create this cut nine miles long. This is the continental divide. If you're joining us from North America, Canada, US, the Rocky Mountains are the continental divide. You know what's incredible about this image? This is about 1913, if I'm not mistaken. 225 feet wide in this image. Currently the cut, what we see right now, is about 700 feet wide. It's incredible how much larger, and the canal is an ongoing work in progress. It never stops, dredging never stops, work never stops, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The canal is alive and it continues. So, okay, so we leave the cut. We've gone through the cut, we've zigzagged our way through the continental divide, and then what do we do? We reach another set of locks, and now we reach the, uh, the Pacific side. Of having reached the Pacific side, we get to Pedro Miguel, which is essentially one step. The ship now gets lowered. Remember, the lake is where all the water is stored, and the lake is the highest point. So essentially by gravity, water is moving from the lake into the cut, right? And then from the cut into the locks. The ship is now being lowered. We were raised on the other side, three steps to 85 feet. We're going to be lowered now three steps from 85 feet down to sea level. When we get to Miraflores Locks, which is the image we can see here, you see the body of water in the background. That is salt water. That is the Bay of Panama. That is the Pacific Ocean. Our ship gets lowered in three steps, as I mentioned. Those gates open up, and voila, we've entered the salt water of the Pacific. But before we actually leave, the Panama Canal, we go under an iconic bridge, which kind of stands for having transited the canal, 
and that is the Bridge of the Americas, the first permanent bridge over the Panama Canal back in 1962. Only 1962 was that bridge built. And that kind of symbols that we've, we've left the Panama Canal. All along, we've had line handlers join us. We've had a Panama Canal pilot on board, which assumes the navigational responsibility of the vessel. And at this point, you'll see little tenders coming. Our, the staff from the Panama Canal leaves, and then the ship continues on its merry way. So that, in essence, I've covered the Panama Canal. What normally takes us eight to nine hours to do, I've covered in a few minutes, Kelly. Yes, you did. And it is such an epic journey that so many of our guests are looking forward to. But we also know that there's just so much more after. So give us a little bit about, just give us some taste of what they can expect. Yeah, you know, I think it's it's interesting because the this itinerary is 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 uh, titled the Panama Canal in Costa Rica, and actually there is a country, there is a Panama, there is a country, and the country of Panama, which we do visit on this tour, besides colonial neighborhoods, uh, the ruins of old Spanish cities, the cosmopolitan richness of Panama City, and the canal, of course, Panama still has a uh, First Nation or Indigenous people living in their own autonomous areas. And a lot of our travelers might know who these folks are. These are the Guna. Now, if it doesn't sound familiar, they used to be called Kuna. So they are now go by the name of Guna. And the area where they live is called the San Blas Islands. Or more appropriately, it's known as Guna Yala, which means the land of the Guna. And on our itinerary here in Panama and Costa Rica, we have an opportunity to visit the, the Guna. And this is where I think the cultural interaction of travel comes in because we're able to share experiences with locals that are not necessarily living in a city or living in a small town, but locals living in a lifestyle in a way totally different than the way we live. You know, thatch huts, thatch uh, bamboo walls, living on the water, uh, thriving from fishing, from coconuts, and obviously making this beautiful reverse applique. Now these of course are, are made for us to purchase because I know we like to purchase items to take home for family, loved ones, those taking care of our pets. There's always someone. So this is a wonderful place to pick up some, some, of, the, um, some of the items to take back home. And the molas, as they're known, the molas are reverse applique patterns, the ladies wear them on their blouse. That's what they make them for. It's part of their attire, their vestment. But they do sell them for us and they display them on this island. And you know what? The Guna, I mean, of all places in the world, of all places in the world they could have picked to live, they picked paradise. They picked the perfect beach setting. And that right there is Hollandis Keys. That's, we actually go there. That image was taken from the beach as the Zodiac is arriving and you see the ship in the background. I mean, look at this place. Oh my God, it's like a screensaver. I mean, this is just like perfect. And right now I know it's it's summer. It's, it's summer in the, in the northern latitudes of the planet. But think about this image come January, February. It's quite enticing. Um, it is just like idyllic, picture perfect. And we actually arrive here and this is where we get to interact with the Kuna. So we have a little bit of culture. We have an opportunity to buy a few items. We have an opportunity to go on a short stroll, learn about how coconuts are part of their life. In fact, coconuts for them is, is a way of, it's a currency. It's a, it's a barter system. They use coconuts to trade with small commercial boats with a lot of the items they might need. Things like fabric that they need, the, the, the needles they use, a lot of the items they use. They actually trade using coconuts, which is kind of interesting. And you know what else we can do here? We have snorkeling opportunities here. So we have masks, snorkels, fins on board, and our guests can go in the water. These You see very calm waters and do some snorkeling on the Caribbean side of, of Panama, which is which is really neat. And, and you know, that's, that's, that's a little bit of taste of what we do in this itinerary. It isn't just about the Panama Canal. It's about, it's about the, the Guna. It's about the nature. It's about learning from those that live in a totally different lifestyle than we do. But, but that's just one. We visit the Guna on the Atlantic side or Caribbean side. We also visit the Embera, 
on the Pacific side. The Embera, a lot of our guests have heard of the Gunas, have heard of the Molas, but a lot of them have not heard of this nation. And they would assume that both nations speak the same language, have the same culture, eat the same foods. It is not the case. The Embera are a totally different group. The Embera, as you can see, where they wear these sarong type fabrics called parumas and not much more. The men wear loincloth and not much more. These folks live traditionally in the rainforest. And in this case, this community, which is goes by the name of Playa del Muerto, if you speak Spanish, doesn't sound too nice, but actually it is magic. Arriving this place is magic. And this is where that 15 foot draft I was talking about, that's what it's all about. We can reach this place on the coast. We take Zodiacs into the beach, we disembark and you can see all of the community comes out. They greet us, they give us a hand, they help us leave the Zodiac and then they host us. And I tell you, it is so cool. The kids just come out and some of the kids are so intrigued by us. Other kids are intrigued by the cameras. And I think this picture says it all, you know, but ultimately they all come, they all join us and it's so much fun. And can you see that they, they have a, it looks like they have tattoos on them. It, the kind of the black, the black, that comes from a fruit called hagua, which is a fruit that's found in the rainforest. They take that fruit, it's like a, a kiwi sized fruit. They slice it open and they grate it like, like Parmesan cheese and they squeeze this juice. And as the fruit oxidizes, it turns black. And so you paint your body and we actually, our guests, you know, they're like, huh, can we? I'm like, of course you can, of course. And we, you know, they sit and they get, they get little lines painted, geometric designs painted on their forearms. Some of our guests in there, you know, in other parts of their body. <laughs> um, I've always said, you know, I'll give you a hundred bucks. If anybody wants the full body tattoo, I'm still waiting for takers. So hopefully you're out there somewhere, but it's a lot of fun. And the idea of interacting with this nation, with the Embera, it's just simply fantastic. You can see in the next image, some of the, how, how photogenic they are. I mean, just beautiful, beautiful people, a lot of smiles and just welcoming, arriving in a vessel like ours makes the difference. You cannot arrive here on a cruise ship. And even if you could, it would not be something sustainable. This is what it's all about. Small ship cruising allows you to visit places like this. And for many years as a naturalist, as a lecturer, and as a tour director, I've said the same thing over and over again. Our guests come to Panama thinking of the Panama Canal. They have that in their minds, but they leave Panama with the Embera people in their hearts. I mean, that's really what it's all about because it's all about people. It's all about interaction between us and them. And there's always music involved, which is always fun. And this video clip says it all. Excellent. Excellent. I can just imagine, I can still remember that the decibels in the lounge the day we returned that evening, they're powerful. I mean, everyone's like, yay, you know, like this was great. This was a highlight. So I, I love that day. Okay. Um, you know, I've talked a little bit about what, what Panama offers and, and the canal and the culture, but you know, 
I think if we if we if we kind of go back to the to the ship, and one of the highlights of of the ship is it's it's the size and the fact that you know we've we've worked up you know we've we we worked up an appetite we've worked really hard we've been out and now we we know you want to enjoy the ship as well and I think um, we do this and the best place to do this is actually when we have a day at sea. And we built a day at sea into our itinerary. So you can take advantage of all these spaces like this. Look, at this is a lounge. This is called the panoramic lounge. This is facing forward. And facing forward, I mean, you can see the, the great light in there, well appointed. And I, you know, I remember seeing all of our guests, you know, finding their corners, the little areas, and just enjoying these great public spaces. So we have that for you if you want to enjoy that. We got a pool on board. I mean, there's a pool on board. And I just came from Scotland. It was a great time to enjoy all these different islands like Orkney and Shetland, but Scotland. Um, so we couldn't really make use of the pool here in the Panama Costa Rica itinerary. It's the tropics. It is warm. And that pool is inviting. So what a great, you could jump in that pool and enjoy the ocean behind you a day at sea. I think that is phenomenal. And then you can also enjoy one of the lectures that we'll have. We have on this departure, two naturalists that join us, two local naturalists that will tell us about the flora, the fauna, the culture, the history, the canal. I mean, they are just walking encyclopedias on any topic in the region. And so they will actually host us with several lectures. And we do offer those at Day at Sea. So you actually can come in and kind of wrap things up or do a little bit of Q&A. And this space, the theater, is just the perfect place to do this. And we have a lot of activities going on. And that's where the program comes in. You open up that program, which gets delivered to your cabin, and you look through it and go, oh, no, there's a lecture at 10 o'clock on this topic. Oh, wait, you know, they're having a, a, a bridge tournament over here. You know, there's always something happening on the day at sea. So I think that is wonderful. But you know what? Maybe you just want to pamper yourself and you just want to pamper yourself and enjoy the spa. And there's a spa on board. Make that appointment. Enjoy the spa. And look at the view. I mean, come on. I mean, <laughs> look at the view here. I mean, that is just like perfect. You know, I mean, exceptional. And, you know, all these spaces are to be found on the vessel. Or maybe, just maybe, for once, you want to, you know, sleep in and enjoy your wonderful room your well-appointed cabin. You can sleep in a little bit on that day. Just enjoy the morning, enjoy the ocean. And who knows, maybe it's from your room as you look out into the ocean that you could even spot some wildlife. And that does happen on day at sea because we have lectures for you. We have the spa. We have all these wonderful spaces for you, these great rooms. But there's also what's out there. And these waters between Panama and Costa Rica are rich in marine life. So don't be surprised if we have dolphins joining us at the bow. So it's, it's just an exceptional, exceptional itinerary. And I think I've mentioned quite a few things. I've mentioned about the canal and culture, uh, history, nature, the ship. Um, Kelly, am I missing something? I must be missing something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Costa Rica. We got to get there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> of course, of course, of course. My neighbors. Pura vida, Costa Rica. So on this itinerary, of course, we visit two countries. And a lot of times we get asked the question, what is the difference between Panama and Costa Rica? I tell you, we there are a lot of similarities between us. We are no, in many ways, not that different from saying I'm from Canada and I'm from the U.S. Both countries share a lot of similarities, but there are a lot of things that set us apart that, that are different. Now, can we enjoy wildlife in Panama? The answer is yes. However, we want to make sure that we take a little bit from every country, piece it together, and create a wonderful itinerary for you. And so I think that in Costa Rica, they've done a great job of creating national parks and taking advantage of their protected areas. And I think a lot of you know, or you might even have been to Costa Rica and you, you, you know, it's synonymous with nature. It's synonymous with ecotourism. 
And that's where we're going to go. We're going to go and visit some of these national parks in Costa Rica. Do you, do you know, I, I, I have to say this. Um, do you know that Costa Rica and Panama are, to my knowledge, the only two countries in the world that share a border and don't have an army? I think that's really cool. And that kind of tells you a little bit about the relationship we have with our neighbors. Um, it's an amicable, great, open relationship that both of our countries have. But let's talk about them. Let's talk about Costa Rica. Let's talk about some of the parks they have. Um, one of the things I love about visiting Costa Rica is that they have national parks that are quite accessible. This is Carrara National Park. And Carrara National Park is one of the parks that we'll visit. On, on our time here in Costa Rica. But I love the fact that the park isn't just about one trail. It isn't just about this is a trail you're gonna take. It's more about, well, what level of a park are you looking for? Or what level of a trail are you looking for? Are you looking for something flat? In this case, you can see it's accessible by many folks and it, remi it remains flat that way. And it allows you to get a taste of the rainforest without things getting too tricky. Then there are other trails that are a little bit more challenging. You know, the, the big roots that are in the trail itself, a little bit of the up, a little bit of the down, a little bit of the slippery. So we have different levels of trails, which I think is, is wonderful. Now, if we go to these national parks like Carrara, what, what are we going to see? I mean, well, we might see one of the emblematic animals of the region and one which Costa Rica has done a great job of preserving and that is the scarlet macaw and scarlet macaws live in this area we might see them at Carrara National Park we might see them in the adjacent protected areas of Carrara National Park we might see them in another part of Costa Rica but they're there and I have to tell you that I, ha having been a TAU tour director and having the opportunity to work in Costa Rica and Panama, but also in Kenya and Tanzania, where wildlife is big, it's big and it's there and you can't miss it. Sometimes it could be a little frustrating to visit the rainforest of Central America and not get the, the look, what you envision to be that perfect look at the animal, whether it's a capuchin monkey, whether it's a howler monkey, whether it's a macaw. And that's where we and the local guides will come in. And to the best of our ability, we'll try to help you. We'll try to find those animals for you. But be patient with us because sometimes wildlife is not as easy to see. Remember, a rainforest is full of magic, but it's also the place where you have predators and prey. And everyone is trying to protect themselves and make sure they don't get eaten. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. But we do visit Carrara National Park. And then there is another park we visit, which I believe it's a household name in Costa Rica. And it's become a household name in many parts of the world. And that's Manuel Antonio National Park. Manuel Antonio is, I, I kind of think of it in many ways, kind of like Yosemite. If you arrive the U.S. and someone says, oh, I, I got to go to a national park. I mean, there are so many different national parks and they're all very different, but it's like, okay, well, let's kind of pick one. It would be like Yellowstone, you know, or the one park that kind of has a little bit of the wildlife, the geology, the landscape, a little bit of everything. And Manuel Antonio is one of those parks. Manuel Antonio, of course, is a park that gets quite a few travelers, not just talc travelers, but a lot of other visitors to Costa Rica, but it has the wildlife. We're joined by guides. They walk us on trails. And once again, we have trails that are, you know, they're flat. A trail is a little longer, a little bit of up, a little bit of down. The other trail is a little shorter. And this allows us to kind of find our niche as of which level do I feel comfortable in. Now, Costa Rica has done something which I think it's kind of cool is not only do you walk through a rainforest, but there are other ways to see a rainforest. And what if you want to see the rainforest from a bird's eye point of view? This is a hanging bridge. And this is something that you can do. You can actually walk. You walk on a trail 
and you take these steps and you take these hanging bridges. Yeah, they're a little wobbly when you're there. They're definitely a little wobbly, but they're extremely safe. I mean, it's all metal and very well done, anchored to these huge concrete slabs in the base. And you can get a bird's eye view of the rainforest, which I think it's kind of cool. And you can see the canopy of the rainforest, which is a part of the forest that we don't really see as we walk through it. Now, this is one way to see the canopy of the rainforest. There are more active, exhilarating, thrilling ways to see the rainforest, and that's zip lining. And you can actually zip your way through the rainforest, and you go from platform to platform, and you just go, and you move right down that zip line, and you're actually getting you know, a little bit of a thrill, but at the same time, enjoying all your surroundings. And I think it's a really cool way to see the rainforest, the rainforest as well. Uh, you know, we also, on this, on this itinerary, we go horseback riding as well. And I know we actually do some rafting on this itinerary. But you might be asking yourself, like, how, how is it possible? How could we possibly do all of these things? I mean, so many different activities. Well, this is where something called choices comes in. And choices allows you, essentially, as the word says it, to choose what you want to do. Now, these are activities that you would pre-choose through Tauk. And when you arrive here in Panama and Costa Rica, we actually make sure you're in that activity. And that way you can pick and choose. What? How do you feel? Do you feel like the hanging bridges is what you want to do? Yeah, let's do that. Zip lighting, maybe it's not for me. But you know what? I think the rafting sounds kind of fun. So these are all activities you would pre-choose and would allow you to experience the region of Costa Rica with just exactly how you think is the way to do it. So I do like this idea of choices in that it allows you to kind of pick and choose what you want to do. And, you know, that's what Costa Rica will offer us. It's this wonderful rainforest in the form of national parks with a lot of different activities out there for one, for one to do. So I have given you a little bit of a taste, I believe, of both countries and what the itinerary is like. And I do look forward to all of you joining us in the near future down here in wonderful Panama and Costa Rica in wonderful Central America. Thank you, everyone. Ivan, amazing. I think that zip lining soundtrack you have there is perfected. Um, just to uh, add on to the idea of choice, it's important that people understand that the choice does not cost extra with TAUC, it is included. So any of the choices that we offer are included. Um, and we did have some questions come into the chat, if you don't mind having a, a couple of those. Um, one of them is, and again, the chat feature is at the bottom of your screen if you want to ask a couple more before we end here. Um, we have some people that are asking about mobility, and it's a particularly important to understand this for this tour. So can you give us your thoughts? Um, yeah. So with mobility, I have to say that the, the ship itself, quite easy to move around. Uh, there's an elevator on board. And I think mobility issues are not so much an issue when you're on the ship, but you have to remember that we're, we're not really motorized vehicles are not really used here. So, or cannot be used here. And you have places like uh, the San Blas, Laguna Yala, and some of the landings in Costa Rica, where we have what's called a wet landing. And a wet landing means that the Zodiac approaches the beach and you have to be able to leave the Zodiac and walk on sand, sometimes hard and compact, sometimes soft and mushy, uh, a short distance or even a little bit longer. So um, there is a, a balance to be said about, about mobility on, on this departure. Yep, absolutely. Um, how about there has been a question about, is there kind of a difference between an East bound or a westbound departure <laughs> of this tour since we do offer both? <laughs> Great question. No, no, that's not fair. That's not fair. That's not fair. <laughs> okay. Um, I tell you what, I've done both eastbound and westbound. How do I feel about both? You know, and this is the answer that I will give. And I think it's the answer that, you know, 
most of us would. And that is, there, there's really no better. What are the, some of the differences? So on the eastbound, you're starting in Costa Rica and you're able to enjoy all the choices and a lot of the culture in Panama and the day at sea. And then the, and the, can, the canal is kind of at the end. So it's, if you want to see it in a certain way, a crescendo towards the Panama Canal, which is why, why a lot of our travelers come here. On the westbound, we do the Panama Canal at the beginning. And in many ways, I, I like that because it's like, okay, you came for the canal. We did it. Cool. Now let's focus on all of the other activities that we have for you that you maybe didn't think about on the departure. So I don't think there's a better east or westbound. I think they're both, they're both great. Yes, fair enough, I said. So how about, um, is it buggy? <laughs> is it buggy? Yes. Um, uh, okay. I know, I know who you are out there. Um, <laughs> usually you're the one that says, there's no bugs here. And then I know who you are out there. Oh my God, it's so buggy here. And you're standing next to each other. Okay. This is the case around the world. Overall, you are going to be surprised at the lack of bugs here. This is the dry season when we run the tour. And really, there aren't that many mosquitoes or bugs as you think there will be. Uh, needless to say, if you're the one that all the bugs are attracted to, having insect repellent is definitely a must when you're down here, having it with you. But you'll, you'll be surprised. I have had the opportunity to live in the U.S., to travel in different parts of the world. Some of my buggiest experiences, if we, if we classify bugs as mosquitoes, no seams, black flies, sand flies, whatever they are, those pesky ones, some of my worst bug experiences have actually been in temperate zones of the planet. Temperate zones meaning the U.S., Mm -hmm. And, you know, places like Alaska, which I'm like, oh, my, I almost got carried away by mosquitoes <laughs> one time. So, I mean, it's crazy. So it's not as buggy as you think it is down here. So don't let that deter you from coming and visiting us. That's a great call. The I am a attractor of bugs. And I have found that they have patches now that you can put on your clothing that have citronella scent. And they seem to work very well. So that's an alternative to kind of carrying around. Uh, some of these sprays in your suitcase. So something to look into. Um, and actually, speaking of carrying around stuff, talk to us about some of your packing suggestions. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. So you have to, I mentioned that on the ship, we have, we have a mask, we have a snorkel, we have fins. So if you want to go snorkeling, we have the equipment for you. But if you go underwater, and you don't wear a mask, you will see the fish and the coral, but it all looks kind of blurry. It's no different when you walk through a rainforest without binoculars. Bring binoculars. That is such a great tool. Yes, you will be able to see things through your naked eye, but binoculars bring it alive, and they bring that animal or that orchid or that plant that's way far much closer. That is definitely a must down here. Those of you that take pictures that you have lenses, yeah, you want to use a larger lens, a 400 millimeter, because it allows you to kind of reach out to those animals that are kind of far. As you walk through the rainforest and you're taking those pictures and you're using the binoculars, it's, it's hot and humid here. It's the tropics. It's hot and it's humid. So quick dry clothing, what a great invention. Oh my, oh my. I mean, it's just great. You know, it wickers the moisture. You know, it dries really fast. So that type of clothing, some of the zip off pants are really handy as well because we get guests that want to wear those. And then like, it's a little warmer than I thought. Oh, zip it off. You're good to go, you know? Yeah. And then when you reach those places, whether it's the Gunayala, the San Blas Islands, whether it's the Darien, whether it's the rainforest in Costa Rica, I think having Tevas, sports sandals, aqua shoes, something that you can wear as you step into the sand with the, with the water and you can use to walk on a trail is actually a really good thing to have on this itinerary for sure. Great suggestions. Absolutely. Um, the last question that we have time to get to is 
around the age of our guests. So is this tour suitable or what would, what do you think? Um, and, and I mean more like the, the children. Yeah. <laughs> People asking think, about kids. So. Yeah, like kids, like families on it? Yeah, families, like, yeah. Yeah. Okay, we've, we've had families on, on this departure. Uh, keeping in mind that this departure generally, traditionally does not have several families on it. So you might have a situation where you have a family on the ship and those kids automatically inherit 60, 70 sets of grandparents right away, um, which could be a lot of fun. Um, but I would think that if, if the family can, can thrive and does well in that environment where there are no other kids on the ship, it would be okay. Once we leave the ship, of course, kids, no matter what the age, whether they're they're young adults, whether they're kids, uh, will find other children, as in any other part of the world, that they can probably, you know, come face to face and interact. Um, keep it in mind, though, that there is a Bridges, our Bridges programs, there is a Bridges uh, tour in Costa Rica. And that might be something they may want to look at as well, because it allows them to see a lot of the rainforest and a lot of the have a lot of the activities, but in an environment where they share their time with other families. Yep, that's a great call. We have a, a wonderful selection of Bridges family adventures designed specifically for multi generational travel, um, and they're all a great option for again children children that think that they're yeah adults that think they're children. So that's okay. a, a great call. Um, well, Ivan, you've taken a lot of time. You have, I think you're packing up and heading out to Amsterdam. So we got to let you go <laughs> again. I am. Um, thank you so much. Really, we appreciate it. Everybody out there, thank you so much for joining us. Um, head over to talk.com and also call a reservation sales counselor. They're there for you. They can chat through any questions that you have. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye, Ivan. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Bye, Kelly. Bye.